Pearls are developed through irritation. Gates of praise are built by responding to difficulty and glorifying God. I had a very unusual experience about one o'clock this morning. Uh, I, I had this phrase going through my mind and then what seemed to be like a hundred different scriptures. I mean, it was, it, was, it was a whirlwind of mental activity, which is not good for me in the middle of the night. <laughs> I can hurt myself doing that. But it, it, I believe it was, a, it was a God moment, a divine moment. And I had so many scriptures going through my mind, uh, concepts, ideas, things that he was, I felt like he was impressing on my heart, showing me. And, um, and thankfully, I, it only lasted about an hour and I was able to go back to sleep till, uh, till my time to get up. But this is, this is the phrase I heard, and then we're gonna unpack it and I'm gonna kind of walk you through this little journey. I heard this phrase, it's kind of strange, but I heard this phrase. Walled, walled cities without gates are not completely safe. Walled cities without gates are not completely safe. Why don't you say it with me? Walled cities without gates are not completely safe. We'll get to that in a moment. Isaiah 60 is, has been such a, a monumental portion of scripture for me. I had uh, what I uh, refer to as one of the two most significant encounters I had with the Lord in my life. Um, this one, it was on a Thursday afternoon in May of 1979. It's affected every day since then because it changed how I thought. And it was an encounter with the Lord where he showed me his heart in this chapter and it, and it wrecked me. Um, so we see in verse one, he says, arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And this tells me then that this chapter, at least this portion of the chapter, is for the church. It's for the church age. The reason we know that is he said, arise, uh, take responsibility, get up, shine. Why? Because your light has come. In John chapter one, it says, Jesus is the light that enlightens every person that comes into the world. Jesus is the light that enlightens every person. The reason I believe that this is for the church age for us right now is because there is not another light coming. Jesus is the light that came. So then that means his coming automatically uh, ignites in me a responsibility to carry out the mandate in this chapter. Arise, shine, your light has come, the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. It goes on, for behold, darkness will cover the earth, deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you, his glory will be seen upon you. It's a wonderful promise that in the time of difficulty is often when the grace of God exceeds the difficulty and the light shines. Where sin abounds, grace, grace does much more abound, yes. And so we know that the Lord will sometimes uh, when things look the worst is when he moves on the scene and he, and he reverses the effect of stuff and, uh, and, and God is then glorified. And it's not darkness and light coexisting. It's that one is defeated uh, openly. So we have that part of, the, uh, of this chapter. Verse three is a favorite of mine. New American Standard says, nations will come to your light, kings to the brightness of your rising. The reason that moves me so deeply uh, is that that's only happened one time in history that I know of. It was during Solomon's reign. As king, he was so uh, famous, if you can use that, he had such an incredible reputation for wisdom, divine wisdom, that people would pay any price to leave where they were to sit at his feet to hear and to learn wisdom. And as Bobby, would Connor, as Bobby Connor would say, uh, it's not about somebody, it's, not, it's about his body. This that is about to happen where the nations will literally feed on the solutions of God for the turmoil and difficulty and challenges of life. They will come not to a individual, but instead they'll come to the people of God that walk in this kind of wisdom. So this really moves me. But when you get down to verse 18 is, was the last part that I remember reading where I really got wrecked in that, um, 
in that Thursday afternoon in 1979, the last part of verse 18, he says, you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. You will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. Salvation is his part, praise is mine. There's a co-laboring here in this metaphoric wall and gates that God is describing here. There is a role that God has. He saves me, I cannot save myself. But my response is a response of praise. He says, your walls will be called salvation, your gates praise. Interestingly, if you follow this theme in Isaiah 60, by the time you get to chapter 62, which is only like 15 or 20 verses later, he says, and your wall, that wall of salvation will be like a torch that is burning. I, I love Bible descriptions because they, they, they challenge me. So here, here we're working with walls that have now become fire. And I'm reminded of what the Lord said in Zechariah. He said, I will be a wall of fire around you. Yeah. And so he, the wall of fire around us, is our salvation. It's a beautiful picture. But there's still a personal responsibility and a personal mandate. And that is the gates of praise. When you get to Revelation chapter 21, you guys still breathing? Yeah. Everybody's still alive? All right. Hopefully this will make sense here soon. Uh, when you get to uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 21, it says the 12 gates were 12 pearls and each individual gate was of one pearl and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. It's a very strange city. It's a very strange wall where you've got, you've got streets that are gold, but it's transparent. You have a wall of fire, the wall of, of salvation, and you have gates that are made out of, each gate is one pearl. I don't know how big is that gate, like the size of the building or something. It's very strange, but there's a picture here that's profound and important for us to catch. Pearls are developed through irritation. Gates of praise are built by responding to difficulty and glorifying God. Anybody can give him praise when you got a raise at work. And we should, we must. Anybody can give him praise when our favorite team wins the NBA championship or World Series or whatever. All of us know how to celebrate in those moments. The challenge comes when I have faced the, uh, a challenge to my faith. Uh, I have suffered loss. I don't know why it happened. I don't know how it happened. I didn't do anything wrong. You know, this crisis happened. This tragedy happened. In those moments, to apprehend our moment and to give him praise in the middle of those, that's where the gate is built. And I, I tell you, it's hard for me to communicate well what I, I had a sense of uh, uh, in the middle of the night last night because I don't want to be alarming. It wasn't a warning in a sense of, oh, no, uh, be careful what's happening. It wasn't that. It was, in fact, my wife actually uh, sent me a text earlier today uh, helping me with language for something. It's because of what's coming, we have to make sure that we got the, we ha we've got this area taken care of. Because of what's on the way, we have to make sure that this mouth gate does not have salt water and, and sweet water coming out of the same fountain, out of the same spring. It's, it's a biblical analogy. Salt water, uh, the bitter water, the sweet water cannot come out of the same mouth. If God, Psalms 22 verse 3 says, God is enthroned upon the praises of his people, right? He's enthroned upon the praises of his people. So who is enthroned on our complaining? If God is enthroned upon the praises of his people, who then becomes enthroned, can I use the word empowered through my criticism? The Bible reveals protocol. It's not ritual, it's not routine without purpose. It's, it's biblical protocol. Psalms 100, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I enter his courts with praise. I 
I enter his presence with praise. Whose presence do I enter with complaining? What gates open to me when I criticize? It's not a light matter. It's not a light matter. James 5 verse 9 says, don't uh, complain or grumble, uh, moan against one another. Brethren, so this is to the church. Brethren is the word in there, all right? And then he follows it because the judge is standing at the door. And so it's like, it's like we know instinctively, we know biblically, we know life and death is in the power of the tongue. But it's a, it's a time when, when I, I get nervous. I, I, thankfully, I, I, I'm telling, I'm, I'm being very transparent here. I don't hear the kind of stuff in this room that I hear elsewhere. I, I, I become afraid for the, for the people of God. I become afraid. I sometimes will listen to somebody who will accuse of the most accuse me or us or somebody I know with, of the most horrible things that I know for a fact are not true. And I become fascinated with how long can they talk without realizing the Holy Spirit is not on what they're saying. Maybe they've never had the, the moment in life where they, they were in partnership co-laboring with the Lord where they could tell something was happening, something was happening that was so significant they took, couldn't take credit for it. It was God working in them and through them. Maybe they've never had that moment because what they're saying right now is as opposite to the nature of Christ. And I'll sit there and I, just, I become fascinated. I wonder, I'll just let them talk because I wonder how long they can do it without realizing God's not involved. And it's not to be mentioned among us. It's this responsibility that I have for my spring, if you will, my, this fountain called my speech is to be that which edifies and encourages. In fact, one of my favorite verses on the subject in the whole Bible is Ephesians 4. I think it's verse 29. It's in that area. It's right side of the page, about two-thirds of the way down. <clears throat> he says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. Only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment that it might give grace to those who hear. A friend of mine did a word study on the unwholesome word and he said basically it means rotten fish. Don't let rotten fish come out of your mouth. That's, that, that was his conclusion. It means rotten fish. So anytime you have something that smelly coming out, just shut your mouth. Just shut up. Just Don't let rotten fish come out of your mouth. Just choose words that are timely and edify. I, I feel like the opportunity that the Lord has given us in this season that we're entering, uh, it's, it's a place of even greater responsibility, greater influence, greater responsibility. Um, oh, <laughs> Jesus put it this way. I put these two together all the time. Jesus said uh, to Peter and the guys, they, had, they left everything to follow him. And he says, I'm going to add 100 times as much into your life with persecution. <laughs> so income, tax. That, that's how favor works. Income tax. Thankfully, he's not a socialist, so the income will always be more than the tax. I usually save my obnoxious statements for the one o'clock meeting. So I don't know. You guys are very special today. When my dad died 14 years ago, he died at the age of 75. In our family, that's extremely young. Uh, his mom lived to 97, and all, all, of, all of our family members, I mean, I, the, the one who was the sickliest, I think died at 86 or something. I mean, it's, it's just crazy. They just all live a long time. And he was the healthiest of all of them. And then he just got sick, and in six months he was gone. He moved here. My mom and dad moved here to help us, <clears throat> to be a part of what God was doing. 
And I remember, you know, anytime you have loss, even if they die at 97, you know, there's, you, there's pain and there's loss, especially a well-loved family member as my dad was, real noble, a real noble uh, man, great, great man. <clears throat> anytime there's loss, there's pain. But when there's what would seem to me at least a 20-year premature loss like that, and to see that happen in front of our eyes as a family, we stayed around him, around his bed for, for I, think, I think we were there basically nonstop for, th- for three days, 72 hours, just being there with him. And uh, the little kids, everybody. And um, I remember when he breathed his last, you have a decision to make, and I you know you've got pain, I've got pain, I've got, all of a sudden I've got loss. I've got the greatest encouragement in my life is now gone. Um, I've got the, the, the pain, pain of loss. I've got the disappointment. We prayed, we did this, we tried that, didn't work. We didn't get breakthrough. You've got the questions. Uh, I, we've seen others healed of this kind of disease, and, uh, but my dad wasn't. You've got the guilt. Uh, could we have prayed differently? Should we have done this? Should we have called a fast? Should we, whatever, just go through the list. We've got all this stuff going on. I have a, a decision to make. I can either let these things infect me or what I can do is let the fire in my soul for God bring these things, the disappointment, the loss, the confusion, the pain, all this stuff, bring it close to the fire so that as I give God my offering, I can give him an offering with a flavor I'll never be able to give him in eternity. Because in heaven there's no pain, there's no loss, no disappointment, there's no confusion, none of that junk is there, it's only here. So I've got a once and an eternity chance to give him that costly of an offering. And it's in pain. So I take all these ingredients, ingredients of loss and pain, all this stuff, hold it close so that as I honor him for always being the healer, the generous promise giver, the one who is perfectly faithful and true, I can do it in the context of pain. See, the gates are made out of pearls. Pearls are, pearls are developed in irritation. They're developed in conflict. I'm thinking this, I burn with this. There's a conflict. And so I'm gonna yield my thoughts to what the word of God declares and I'm gonna give him an offering. Why? Because the gate is something he comes through. 